class, today we're going to talk about the immune system. So chapters 12 and 13 of your textbook cover host defenses, which is basically the immune system. And um, on Adverum, I already have for you this chart, which is what I'm going to use to kind of summarize everything. So you're welcome to follow along with me and uh, annotate this chart. But what you see here is that the immune system is compromised of three different levels. So there's the first line of defense. The first line of defense is going to be your physical and chemical barriers. So the goal of the first line of defense is just to keep pathogens out. Keep them out so that they cannot even cause an infection. Once they're inside of your body and they're reproducing, um, that means you now have an infection. And then if they start disrupting your cells and your tissues and causing damage, then you're going to have a disease. So that's basically your definition of infectious disease is that those pathogens are reproducing and causing damage to your internal environment. So if they do make it past the first line of defense, then you go to the second line of defense. And the second line of defense um, is nonspecific. So that means they don't really know what they're fighting. They're just fighting anything that looks foreign. And they can tell if something is foreign or not because your body cells will have special protein markers on them that identify them as self. And then anything that has markers, or um, they're called antigens, anything that has protein markers or antigens on them that do not match self will be considered to be foreign. And so your second line of defense is going to be made up of a whole bunch of different white blood cells that uh, use a process called phagocytosis, which means they basically eat up um, they swallow and eat up these uh, particles, these pathogenic particles, and then they destroy them. In addition to that, they're going to send out chemical messengers, and the chemical messengers can promote things like inflammation and fever, so we'll go into more detail about that. And then there's a, finally the antimicrobial proteins, those are things like um, interferon and complement, which we'll talk about more later. Now, after the second line of defense is activated, we also activate the third line of defense. So the second and the third line of defense work simultaneously. It's just the second line of defense is faster, okay, because they're going to attack anything that is uh, foreign, while the third line of defense is slow the first time around. So the first time that you're infected with this pathogen, the third line of defense is slow because it has to learn what the pathogen looks like. But what that means is it's going to be specialized. And specialized means that each of these uh, BNT cells, so those are your two types of cells that are part of your uh, third line of, of defense, they're specialized and will only match up with one particular type of pathogen. So you might have a B cell for measles and a T cell for measles, but those BNT cells would not help you fight influenza. So they're gonna be specialized and after they have learned what this pathogen looks like, they will also launch uh, an attack and help you to recover. And once you recover, they can form memory cells. And those memory cells often, um, often are lifelong. They don't always last your entire life, but they do la last a really long time. And they remember what this pathogen looked like so that if you are infected a second time, then they are really fast. And so they actually can defeat the pathogen in the second infection um, so fast that you never develop symptoms. And we'll talk later um, in a different chapter about how vaccinization actually helps promote this, right? It helps promote the memory cells so that you never get sick. Okay, so let's um, go back to the first line of defense and go into a little bit of more detail on what's going on here. So sometimes what I do with immune system is I kind of compare it to medieval warfare because it's sort of an easy way to uh, imagine what's going on. So your physical barrier, think of your physical barrier as if you, you have a castle that you're trying to defend. What is the best way to defend your castle? So most castles are going to have a very thick, large wall around them, okay? So the physical barrier is kind of like that wall, okay? The wall around the castle. And even though there's an army trying to siege this castle and break through, the physical barrier is excellent at keeping those foreign soldiers out. However, if they create a chink in the wall, okay, if they crack open the wall, or if they find a hidden entranceway, an, a gate that nobody is watching or that nobody's protecting, 
then they could sneak into the castle and get in. And that's where um, your chemical barriers come in place. So you have also something called uh, portals of entry. And portals of entry are places in your body that are not protected, not protected by your physical barrier. So your physical barrier, by the way, is basically your skin. Okay, so that's your main physical barrier. And when we say skin, of course, we're talking about stratified squamous epithelium, which is also keratinized. And so it's very thick, very, um, very difficult for any kind of pathogen to break through the skin as long as it's healthy and as long as there's no cuts or scrapes or punctures or any kind of wounds. So skin is your very strong, thick wall protecting your body. Your portals of entry are places where there are openings in your skin. So places like your mouth, your nose, your ears, your eyes, um, the genitourethral area, right? So your, your urethra, the vagina, um, also the anus. So any place where there's a hole that allows a pathogen to get into the body. So we have chemical barriers protecting those uh, protecting those portals of entry or exit. So going back to the physical barrier real quick, the skin, of course, um, as I said, it's a very thick barrier and it's keratinized, which means it's stuffed full of keratin protein um, and those top layers of cells are actually dead, but they're too thick for any sort of bacteria or virus to be able to penetrate through on their own. Um, in addition to that, the pH of skin is slightly acidic and we also have some fatty acids there. And both of those help um, decrease the number of microbes that can live there. There are normal microbes that live on your skin, and so I'll talk about those on a different day. Um, but there's normal microbes that aren't causing you any, any harm. And then of course there's the pathogenic microbes. Now if the pathogenic microbes are on the skin but the skin is healthy, they're not going to cause you any trouble. But if you get any sort of small scrape or wound, or even um, like let's say uh, the hair follicles for example, hair follicles um, go deeper into the skin and maybe you pull out a hair or something like that, that can cause some damage. So even that can be a little portal, portal of entry. Um, let's see, what else? We also have some other physical things such as um, nasal hair. So nasal hair helps filter out particles uh, from the air that you're breathing in. There's also going to be mucus, though that goes more under chemical barriers. Um, but the nasal hair itself is a physical barrier, um, ear hair. So people, you know, usually don't enjoy having a lot of ear hair, but it's there for a reason. It's to help kind of protect your ear canal because that's another uh, portal of entry to your body. And then even something like your sphincter muscles. So your nose, your eyes, your mouth, those are much more open, but something like your anus has a sphincter muscle. So in general, things aren't going in there. Um, it's only open when you are defecating, okay, and then something's coming out. So it would be actually pushing things out and not letting um, bacteria and pathogens back up in there. The urethra does also have a sphincter muscle, but it's a little bit higher up in the tube. So the very end where the urethral opening is, is not as protected. And so you can get urinary tract infections, um, but as they go higher up, like as they're traveling up that uh, urethra, usually they're blocked and then they're not going to get all the way up to the bladder but of course it is possible it kind of depends on the situation so now let's look at your chemical chemical barriers the chemical barriers are there to protect these portals of entry so for example your tears are not just to clean out debris they also have special enzymes called lysozymes and the lysozymes will destroy pathogens they will also um, well, yeah, they basically destroy pathogens. Uh, they're really great against bacteria um, because they can help destroy the cell wall of the bacteria. Then you have your saliva. So saliva does have enzymes. Um, some of the enzymes are for helping you digest, but some of the enzymes are actually also to help destroy bacteria. Now, you do have a lot of bacteria in your mouth, so there's naturally occurring bacteria there, and some of them can cause things like dental disease. So your saliva is not perfect or anything, um, but it can help a little bit. Then we have, of course, mucus. So the mucus in your nasal cavity is produced in response to any kind of foreign particle. It doesn't even have to be pathogenic. Um, as you know, sometimes people are very allergic to things like pollen or um, cat dander or other kinds of animals. but uh, when the epithelium of the nasal cavity is irritated, it'll produce mucus, and then the mucus is supposed to help push out the 
the particles. And if you recall, we have your pseudostratified ciliated cells that help kind of sweep the mucus outwards. So then let's say something did go in through your mouth. Um, in fact, when you're eating food, anything that's raw and hasn't been cooked is gonna have bacteria on it. I mean, there's no way to avoid that. So your fruits and your vegetables are gonna have bacteria. It's just that most of them are not harmful. And then of course, every once in a while, you'll hear about cases of salmonella or E. coli um, contamination, and you can get food poisoning. But one thing that's helpful is if you do swallow some food with bacteria in it, your stomach acid is going to help destroy most of those pathogens. Okay, so the stomach acid, hydrochloric acid, is very, very strong um, and will destroy most pathogens. Then uh, moving over to the ear. Earwax is kind of a specialized uh, type of material. It's produced similarly to the oil of your skin, um, which are, uh, if you recall, were the sebaceous glands of the skin. But earwax is a little bit thicker and it does provide this sort of waxy layer on the inside of the ear canal that helps protect it. Uh, even sweat. Okay, so sweat also has a slightly uh, low uh, pH um, to help kind of destroy any microbes that are on your skin. Though again, it won't work against all of them. So speaking of normal bacteria, okay, so your normal microbiome can actually help you because they can do something called um, microbial antagonism. And the idea is that because, for example, there's so much bacteria already living in your mouth, if something foreign comes in that's um, pathogenic, but there's only a few of them, they can't outcompete the existing bacteria. And we see this, of course, when people start to take antibiotics for a different kind of infection. They start taking antibiotics and it kills some of their normal microbiome. Then they have uh, consequences. For example, the yeast that was living in their mouth, the Candida albicans, which we talked about, which is very minor amount, can start to take over. And then they'll have yeast infection in their mouth. They'll have what's called oral thrush due to the lack of microbial antagonism. So that basically takes care of um, the chemical barriers. Oh, actually, I wanted to write one more thing. Um, the vagina also has a low pH. Okay, so it has the same situation where there's a normal bacteria that live there and they prefer this low pH, but if something disrupts that environment, then it's not uncommon to get a yeast infection because the, the fungus starts to take over since the microbiome has been disrupted. Okay, so that's first line of defense. And um, before I go to the next slide, um, let's talk a little bit about second line of defense. So what's going on? Think of it like I said, uh, your, your castle is being protected by a wall, but what if someone makes it through, right? So the soldiers destroyed a part of the castle or they maybe they got one of those um, uh, battering rams and they broke down the gate. So now they're swarming into the castle. So what are you gonna do about it? Well, your castle should have some soldiers and your first line of defense Sorry, your first line of defense is the wall, but the second line of defense are going to be your non-specific soldiers. So these are kind of like your foot soldiers, the ones who are just there um, to attack whoever is coming through the gate. And so um, we're gonna talk a lot about these white blood cells that use the phagocytosis. So that's gonna be on my next slide. This is also a picture uh, from your textbook, and what it does is it's listing a whole bunch of different white blood cells. So white blood cells are super cool, they have different jobs and so I'm going to talk to, uh, to you about them a little bit and then we'll look at who's specialized and who's not. So actually I can I can do that first because it's really straightforward. Um, let's see your B and your T cells those are your specialized specialized cells which means everybody else is non-specialized but you should know a little bit about the differences between them. So neutrophils. Neutrophils are going to be the most common white blood cell in, uh, in your blood, circulating in your blood. Okay, so they're the most common. And they're usually the first responders. So the moment that something, for example, punctures your, your skin, you got a little cut or a little puncture wound, 
and some bacteria entered, these guys are right there and they're going to be there um, to fight off that infection. And if you start seeing um, like pus from a wound, that's actually all of these neutrophils along with some macrophages that are there fighting the good fight and they're dying as part of the process. And so that's why it looks kind of like white and yellow um, when the pus is oozing out there because all of these you know millions of cells are there fighting and some of them die while they're doing this. So while they're destroying the uh, pathogens, they also give up their lives. So neutrophils are a type of phagocyte. Okay, so like I said, phagocyte means that they basically like swallow up, just like a little Pac-Man. They're gonna swallow up this bacteria and then once it's inside of them, they destroy it and it becomes little particles and then the little particles can be expelled because they're not harmful anymore. So neutrophils, very, very, very common in the blood. Also, um, notice that they're kind of color-coded here a little bit. So neutrophils tend to look purple. Even though they are white blood cells, so actually technically they're white, but when you look at them in a slide under the microscope, we do dye them. So neutrophils are gonna look purple, basophils are gonna look blue, and then eosinophils are gonna look red. And that's one of the ways that we distinguish them is by their colors. Also notice um, they're clumped together as something called a granulocyte. So that's because they have these granules inside of them. That's what actually picks up the color. And the granules are various types of chemicals, um, chemical messengers that they can release later on. So let's talk a, a little bit about eosinophils. They're pretty cool. Um, they can be elevated if you have certain types of parasitic infections like worms. So if we do a blood smear and we see a lot of eosinophils, we might think, hmm, maybe it's a helminth infection. And then we could do some uh, additional tests to find out about that. Basophils are associated with inf uh, inflammation. And in fact, they're really important when we talk about allergies later. And that's because what the basophils do is they release a chemical called histamine. So when you hear about people taking antihistamines, why are they taking the antihistamines? It's actually to block all of the chemicals being released by this basophil. So what does uh, histamine actually do? Its purpose is to make capillaries more permeable, um, and that's going to be important for white blood cells because the white blood cells are quite large and they need to squeeze out of the capillary to reach their target. So if you have a localized injury and uh, there's some kind of potentially pathogen there, then the basophil will release this histamine and then the white blood cells can exit the capillaries and go into the injured area to help clean up, you know, to help destroy any pathogens and also to help clean up injured tissue and so forth. So it's going to be a big, um, a big response during the inflammatory process. Mast cells do a similar thing. So mast cells also are part of the inflammatory response. Uh, so they're very similar to basophils. But in general, one thing about basophils is they're pretty rare. Okay, so they're much lower in the blood than uh, things like neutrophils. And then mast cells are larger than basophils. <clears throat> um, plus mast cells tend to hang out in the mucous membranes. Okay, so they tend to hang out, in, hang out in the mucous membranes while basophils can actually circulate. So then let's look over here at monocytes. So monocyte, is the name of this blood cell while it's still circulating. And then what happens is when it's activated, it becomes a mature cell and it becomes either a macrophage or a dendritic cell. So those two have basically the same kind of job, which is that they are very large uh, phagocytic cells. So macrophage, really, really important. Other than neutrophils, it's usually the macrophages that come to the site of infection and eat up all the particles. So they're gonna be really big, woo, like that. And they're just gonna be eating up all of these little bacteria and other pathogens that they can find. So very, very important. Um, they're also gonna be responsible for signaling the T cells. Okay, so they're going to signal the T cells what's going on. And then the same thing with dendritic cells. The main difference, uh, dendritic just means that if you look at the cell, it looks like it has these long projections coming off of it and they just use that to kind of help grab the pathogen. And dendritic cells also are going to be signaling cells. So they're gonna help activate the T cells. So that entire list, your neutrophil, basophil, eosinophil, mast cell, macrophage, and dendritic cell, these are all non-specific. 
or also re referred to sometimes as unspecialized cells. Your B and T cells, on the other hand, are specialized, which means they have to be activated. So even though they do exist in your body and they can be floating around in your blood, they're not doing anything right now and they have to be activated and there's a whole sequence of events that has to happen for that to work. Then on this side, you do have uh, natural killer cells. So they're kind of uh, strange. Technically, they belong in the group of lymphocytes. So B and T cells are lymphocytes and natural killer cells also belong in the group with lymphocytes. However, they are nonspecific. And what they do is a bunch of cool stuff, um, but one of the most important is they can fight cancer cells. So they can help identify uh, cells that do not look normal anymore and um, can help destroy cancer. So it's something that we do investigate, you know, why is it that some people have higher chances of cancer than other people, even if they weren't exposed to certain environmental uh, chemicals or environmental radiation, why is it they have higher chance of cancer? And sometimes it has to do with the immune system. So some people are just better at detecting and eliminating their own cancer. So it's not that they never develop cancer cells, it's that they kill them before they could become harmful and grow tumors. Okay, so let's go into a little bit more detail about the second line of defense. So phagocytosis, we'll just kind of uh, refresh our memories about that. So that's where your neutrophils and your macrophages are going to come into play and they're just swallowing up these different pathogens and trying to destroy them. In addition, they're going to be releasing a number of different chemicals, okay? So they can release chemicals, chemical messengers, and the chemical messengers are actually called cytokines. But the cytokines can then influence these next two processes. So inflammation and fever. So let's talk about fever first because that's really cool. Uh, fever is your body's attempt to increase its temperature to a point that it inhibits the growth and reproduction of the pathogen. So the point is to increase your body temperature temporarily to inhibit the growth of the pathogen. And the idea of that is, if you recall, we talked about um, what temperatures different microbes prefer, and most human pathogens prefer 37 degrees Celsius. That's what they like. So if you raise that temperature by even one degree Celsius, which doesn't sound like a lot, but even one degree Celsius, you can start disrupting their ability to function because some of their enzymes may not work properly, or if nothing else, it at least slows them down. It might not kill them, but it's slowing them down so they can't activate their own proteins and enzymes and they can't reproduce. So if they can't reproduce, now your immune system has a fighting chance and has a better chance of destroying them quickly. Otherwise, these bacteria, some of them can divide every 20 minutes. So they're doubling their numbers every 20 minutes, right? Meanwhile, you only have so many white blood cells. So being able to inhibit the growth is really, really helpful. And what that means is we actually want fever in certain situations. But what we want is we want a mild fever, okay? So something like, um, of course, now I'm going to change my, my uh, unit, but 100 to 101 Fahrenheit is considered to be an okay fever, okay? But once you get to 104, that's pretty risky. So 104 to 106 fever uh, of Fahrenheit is, um, is dangerous. And the reason is that we have enzymes too. Okay, and our cells have enzymes that also prefer normal body temperature. So when we have a fever, our body doesn't particularly like that either. Our cells aren't happy either, but they're okay with it temporarily as long as we're getting rid of this pathogen. However, if you have fever for long periods of time or it spikes really high, then now you're damaging your own cells and some of them will be damaged to the point that they can't revert back to normal. So this is especially true for the brain, okay? And there are cases of people who have such a high fever um, that even after they recover and they, they get rid of their infectious disease, they have potentially brain damage afterwards. And the brain damage can be quite severe, you know, anywhere from, we hear about cases of children who had scarlet fever and um, develop blindness or deafness afterwards. And then sometimes it can be even more severe and have like all sorts of cognitive effects. So definitely we wanna be careful with the fever.
Now let's go over to, let's talk about the antimicrobial proteins real quick. Um, so antimicrobial proteins, there's two main areas. Interferon is a type of chemical signal that is released by cells that are infected with a virus, okay? So that's kind of cool. So they can actually send out this messenger that says, hello, I'm infected by a virus, and then what it will do is it can cause a bunch of different um, responses by other cells of the body who then try to protect themselves to the best that they can. Um, it can promote inflammation, and we'll talk about inflammation in a little bit. So it can promote inflammation. It can um, bind to these foreign particles and what that does is it will increase phagocytosis. Um, other things it can do actually is interesting. Um, they can activate those natural killer cells, okay, increase the natural killer cell activity. And so because of that, it can al also help um, reduce cancer. If you may recall, so some, some viruses can create cancer because they can inject themselves into the host DNA and cause damage. So being able to identify these virus infected cells early and destroy them um, can also help reduce cancer risk. The second antimicrobial protein is something called complement. And what complement does, um, it does a bunch of different things, but the easiest way to understand what they do is there's like this whole chain of events and in the end, so let's say this is a bacteria cell, okay? In the end, what the complement will do is it will create this pore that forms in the cell wall. And because there's a pore, it means that now um, the external environment and the internal environment are not as separated, so things like water, for example, could rush in and cause the cell to explode. So complement's pretty awesome because what it does is it causes cell lysis, okay? And it actually helps destroy the pathogenic cell. All right, so then let's move on to inflammation. So inflammation, I'm sure you have experienced this at some point because it happens anytime there's damage. So it doesn't even have to be from an infection. It could just be from like bumping against a wall and you have a bruise and then you have like some swelling and redness in that area. So what's going on? Um, there's actually the, the four signs are ruber, tumor, dollar, and calor. And what do those mean? So ruber means redness, tumor means swelling, dolor means pain, and calor means heat. Why is this actually happening? So it's happening um, for a number of reasons. The, the most obvious is that there's these chemical messages that are being sent out by the injured area. Okay, so we're talking about cytokines. So they're sending out basically SOS signals saying, hello, we're injured, help us, you know, there's something going on. So what's gonna happen next? Well, um, these chemical signals will increase, they're going to increase vasodilation. And what that means is that the local area where the injury occurs, the capillaries are going to swell up, right? So the capillaries are going to swell up, and this results in the heat and the redness because you can now see more blood flowing underneath the skin. So the heat and the redness are from these capillaries vasodilating. Why are they doing that? They're doing that because they want to attract more white blood cells to this area and they want to make it easier for the white blood cells to get to where they need to go. So the white blood cells are going to come to this area and they use a process called chemotaxis. Okay, so they're following the chemical messengers to, to figure out where they need to go because they were just floating around in the blood. They were everywhere in your body, but now they know, hey, you know, oh, you just bumped your elbow. Okay, the elbow is the place where we need to go and they're gonna follow the chemical messengers to that local area. Once um, they're close to that area, so they're in the capillaries, what they're gonna do is they're gonna migrate out of the capillary through a process called diapedesis. Diapedesis. And what that means is uh, the capillary has also become more permeable, which means it's leaky. 
And when we say leaky, um, it's not so leaky that the red blood cells can come out. Okay, so you're not going to be bleeding underneath of your skin. You don't want that. Um, that's a sign of injury. That's a bad thing. But they're going to be leaky in the sense that the white blood cells can actually change shape. So um, let me just kind of like draw this. So here's your capillary and here's your normal red blood cells, you know, floating along. And then there's actually little cracks in between the epithelial cells but those cracks aren't big enough for these red blood cells. However, a larger white blood cell is coming along and it's gonna squeeze itself through. And once it squeezes itself through, then it can find the pathogens, you know, that are next to that capillary and it'll eat them. So it can squeeze out of there. But because of those little cracks, you do get fluid that can exit. And because the fluid can exit, that's why you get the swelling, okay? So the name for that is edema. And the leaky capillaries do cause localized edema. Pain, well, pain is just from the fact that, you know, if there was any sort of um, nerve ending in that location and it was damaged, then it lets you know, hey, I'm injured in this area. So that's the pain. All right, I think that covers everything for second line of defense. So all of this is happening at the same time. Um, and while this is happening, the B and T cells are going to be activated. But again, that's a slower process. It takes a little bit longer. So let's look at our B and T cells. So third line of defense. <clears throat> so first of all, how are they activated? OK, so it can be activated directly. Um, this isn't as common, but this can happen for B cells. So the idea is that the B cell would actually come into contact with the antigen and it would activate it, okay? But more often, it has to be activated by something called an antigen presenting cell. And the antigen presenting cells are, for example, macrophages and macrophage and the dendritic cells. Now there's gonna be some nicer pictures of this in, in your next chapter, but let's just do like a really small drawing of what's going on. So here's my macrophage, and then here's the little bacteria that's being swallowed. And what's gonna happen, which is really cool, is the macrophage is gonna break up this bacteria, and on the outside of it, it's going to display little pieces of that bacteria. It's gonna display little pieces that are the antigens, okay? So those are the antigens, which are not harmful anymore because it's not a whole living pathogen, it's just a little piece of it, and it's gonna display it and be like, hey, here's a piece of what we're fighting, this is what we're looking for. So then the T cell, okay, so the antigen presenting cell is um, the macrophage right there, and then here's your T cell, Actually, I won't, do an, I won't do an arrow, but I'm just going to write T cell. And the T cell happens to be floating around. And what's going to happen is if this part right here, if it matches the antigen, then it will activate. So what do we mean by that? What we mean is that you have millions and millions of T cells that are inactive right now. They're floating around. And some of them are for measles, and some of them are for smallpox, and some of them are for influenza, and some of them are for you know salmonella, and they're just floating around. But when you get this infection, and this uh, macrophage comes up to the T cell and shows it the antigen, and it actually matches, now this T cell is activated. So what happens next? Well, this new activated T cell can then activate the B cell. So that's more common. So I said that the B cell could be directly activated, that's true, but it's not as common. More often, the whole process is that first, an antigen presenting cell has to come to the T cell, so then it goes to the T cell, then the T cell becomes activated, so the T cell is activated, and then finally, after the T cell is activated, it can then activate the B cell. Oh my gosh, so that's a really long process. So antigen presenting cell, goes to the T cell, T cell becomes activated, T cell then activates the B cell. So what happens when the B cell is activated? 
it transforms into something called a plasma cell. And the plasma cell is going to produce antibodies. So I'm going to use a different color for my B cell. But basically, um, what a B cell looks like is it has these, and I know I kind of drew things that look similar to that up there, but these um, Y-shaped things on the outside of the B cell are actually called um, immunoglobulin. Okay, so immunoglobulin, and when the plasma cell activates, what it will do is it will release free-floating immunoglobulin into the bloodstream, and the immunoglobulin can then uh, block, well, they can do a whole bunch of things, but one of the things they can do is, let's say this was the bacteria, I'm just gonna call it pathogen. Um, so the pathogen has those special markers on it, so those are the antigens. And this B cell is specific to that antigen the same way that the T cell was specific to that antigen. So these, um, these antibodies are going to match up perfectly. Okay, so the antibodies must match. And the antibody is, is just another name for the immunoglobulin. Um, there's actually a couple different types of immunoglobulin. We'll, we'll talk about them more later. But that's kind of uh, this end result here, is that the immunoglobulin has been released. It's going to uh, stick to the, the antigens. And that actually helps increase phagocytosis. So it helps uh, deactivate. So they do a bunch of things. The antibodies help to deactivate the pathogen. And they also help to increase uh, phagocytosis increase phagocytosis because the macrophages will be more attracted to these things and they also help like link them together and a whole bunch of other stuff. Okay, so the T cell activated the B cell, but you know what it can do? It can also activate other types of T cells. So let's try to summarize some of that over here. Um, okay, so if you're a B cell, you will form a plasma cell if you're activated, but you can also form something called memory cells. And what that means is that the plasma cells, uh, the plasma cells will make antibodies, but they're going to die uh, after the infection is over. So they're gonna die later, uh, die later. In comparison, memory cells don't die. They live and they're waiting basically for a second infection. And the second time you're infected, they will become infection. Uh, they're waiting for a second infection, and if that happens, they will become activated again and make more plasma cells. So that's a really unique thing about, you know, the third line of defense right here is that it's specialized and that it has memory. Um, by the way, another name for that is acquired or specific immunity. So that all means the same thing. So acquired means you acquired these cells because you got the experience of being infected and then once you were infected and you learned what the pathogen looked like now you have acquired immunity to it and that's what we mean when we say that you're immune to something it's not that the pathogen can't enter your body again it absolutely can it's just that now you have these memory cells and the memory cells are like oh i am on that i know exactly what this is and i know how to fight it and very quickly there's a response so that's the b cell the T cell um, does require activation, okay, so it requires activation, specifically from these antigen presenting cells. And there's a couple different kinds. You have what's called a T helper cell. The T helper cell is the main cell that kind of tells everyone else what to do. So once the T helper cell has been activated, it can activate other types of T cells. And some of them will also become memory cells. Okay, so that's true for the, the T cell as well. But one of the other types of cells it activates is called a cytotoxic T cell. So what's the difference there? They can actually be recognized um, 
in terms of what they look like, they both kind of look like little purple blobs, but they can be recognized by special markers on them. And so that's gonna be important. So the, the helper cell has something called a CD4 marker on its cell, while the cytotoxic cell has something called a CD8 marker on its cell. And that's gonna be important because sometimes um, in different textbooks they'll call them CD8 T cells or CD4 cells. So they'll just use that terminology and it's expected that you understand that the CD4 cell is the helper T cell and the CD8 cell is the cytotoxic T cell. The other thing that they do is um, those proteins are going to be responsible for linking with certain other cells. So when the T cell activates the B cell, it's almost like it does a little handshake. Um, and I don't know if I want to go into too much detail right now because this is moving into the, chap the next chapter really but I just wanted to kind of give you a heads up about it. And then the other thing um, that I want to add here is that, so speaking of CD4, so CD4 is what is targeted by HIV. So when you hear about HIV, what the virus does is it finds the CD4 and it uses it to trick the T helper cell to bringing the virus inside of itself. And once it's inside, the virus can reproduce, and as it does so, it kills that T helper cell. So when we talk about HIV destroying the immune system, this is why. It's not killing the CD8 cell, it's not killing the macrophage or the, the B cell or the natural killer cell or any of those other cells. It's targeting specifically the T helper cell. But when you kill this T helper cell, this is a, like right here, you're stopping this whole process at step number three. So if the T, the T cell's dead, it can't activate other T cells, it can't activate B cells, it can't activate anybody, it's just dead. So looking at your CD4 uh, count in your blood is really important to help diagnose if someone has AIDS or not because you normally have about 500 or more um, CD4 cells in a sample but once it falls below about 200, then we now call that individual as having AIDS because that means that their immune system is gonna be so weak that the opportunistic infections are going to take over. Um, what else do I wanna say? I think I'll just add a little bit about how BNT cells are lymphocytes. But just don't forget that in our previous chart we saw uh, if we go all the way back here, that even though BNT cells are lymphocytes, so are natural killer cells. So natural killer cell, uh, cells over here are non-specific lymphocytes, but BNT cells are specialized lymphocytes. And then anything else? I'm just going to very quickly mention that the way that this whole display thing happens is we have something called a major histocompatibility complex. And major histocompatibility complex is something you may have heard about um, referred to when people talk about organ transplants. So one of the ways your body recognizes itself is that all of your body cells will have the major histocompatibility, it's hard to say guys, but it's the MHC class one uh, protein. Okay, so all of your body cells have the MHC class one protein. And what this means is that if someone else is donating an organ to you and their MHC class one protein doesn't look like yours, then your body automatically thinks that it's foreign and will attack it. So this is what they're talking about when they say matching, trying to match organs, is they want to find someone whose MHC class one protein is as similar to yours as possible so that there's less chance of an immune response. And it's really never going to be a perfect match except for uh, people who are lucky enough to have an identical twin who can donate an organ to them. But in no other situation would it be a perfect match. It would just be similar enough that the immune system might not attack right away and that you can use immunosuppressors to kind of um, decrease that reaction. But if someone has a super different MHC class 1, then you're going to have a huge organ rejection problem. The other thing is you also have an MHC class 2. Um, so I don't want to go into too much detail about that, but the MHC class 1 and class 2 are slightly different from each other. Okay, so I think that's going to conclude my lesson for today. That, I know that was a lot of information, um, but please just read the book to get some more background on all of this, and then we will continue our lesson next time.